Hi everyone, this is Dane Wilkins. I've served Zone 7 for the last four and a half years as an instrumentation technician, and today I wanted to share a brief glimpse into our section through a job we recently completed involving a few of the team members that make up maintenance for our agency. You'll be joining us as we replace the Delval Water Treatment Plant Thickener Inlet Flow Meter. I hope you enjoy it. It's about 8 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, and the maintenance crew is preparing for their Thickener Inlet Flow Meter replacement job. Some preparation is needed before the job even begins. We can see Reno lowering down a ladder for easy access in and out of the vault. There's a yellow tube that's connected up to a blower for forced air in the vault to maintain proper atmospheric condition to perform the work. Some of you may be familiar with a piping and instrumentation diagram, also known as a P&ID. This is a diagram in the process industry, which shows the piping and process equipment together with the instrumentation and control devices for a given site. Highlighted in yellow is our flow tube that needs to be changed out. And in red, we see the two feed pumps, the upstream isolation valves, the downstream isolation valve, and the transmitter portion of our flow device located in our solids handling control room. Here we can see Tom preparing the crane to not only hoist the old flow tube out of the site, but also lower the new flow tube in for installation. Preparation is also needed ahead of time to collect the hardware used for the installation. Things such as nuts, bolts, gaskets, and a variety of tools will be used for this job today. Another precaution taken is the locking out of equipment that is tied to this particular site that allows for safe work to be conducted by everyone involved. Isolating things such as valves and disconnecting circuit breakers are essential to performing safe work. This procedure is formally known as lockout tagout within the industry. An initial entry is performed to ensure there are no unforeseen circumstances. On top of the flow tube itself is a terminal box where the wires enter into and connect to the electronics within. These have to be unlanded before they can be removed or before the flow tube can be pulled from the vault, as well as before any kind of work on the new conduit to the new flow tube can begin. What we have in this particular instance is a length of rigid conduit that's been anchored to the wall which connects up to some FMC, which is flexible metal conduit running to our flow tube, the purpose of which is to protect the conductors as well as keep a watertight seal and allow some maneuverability in installing and maintenancing the flow tube going forward. Magnetic flow meters work based on Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. When a conductive medium, in this case the fluid within our pipe, passes through a magnetic field, a voltage is generated, which is proportional to the velocity of the fluid, the density of the magnetic field, and the length of the conductor. In a magnetic flow meter, a current is applied to the wire coils mounted within the meter's body to generate our magnetic field. The liquid flowing through the pipe acts as a conductor, and this induces a voltage which is proportional to the average flow velocity. This reading is ultimately what gets reported to SCADA. With each flow tube in our system, there is measured criteria to assess and verify the health of our electronics within the device. This thickener inlet flow tube did not pass that measured criteria, where we should have seen an infinite amount of resistance between the electromagnetic coil and ground, we saw a high reading in the kilo-ohm range. This validated our suspicion that water had intruded into the terminal case and created a high resistance short between these two points. Since this was a high resistance short, it did not overload any electronics or blow any fuses. An important aspect of our work process is how a job progresses during unforeseen circumstances, part availability circumstances, shipping time constraints, and other factors. This thickener flow meter issue was originally reported by operations in mid-August of this year. Maintenance responded to assess the issue where we were able to determine the best course of action. In between August and the 20th of October when this work was completed, a variety of factors, as mentioned before, as well as other work needing priority resolutions were experienced. But with our maintenance management system, a documented history of any one job can be seen and referred to. This allows transparency upon its creation, during preparation and planning, and also upon closure of the work order to serve as a record of what was done. Resuming where we left off, the wire terminals need to be loosened to allow the individual wires to be pulled free of the old flow tube. The flexible metal conduit is then removed as well. The wires will need to be pulled through a new short section of flexible metal conduit, which will be sealed at the point on the wall where it joins with the rigid conduit, and also on the flow tube where the wires enter the terminal case. 
The existing wire jackets are to be wiped and cleaned beforehand so that later the outer jacket and wires can be cut and stripped to expose new conductors that will be landed on the new flow tube terminals once it has been installed. Reno can be seen using a lubricant on the threads to remove the nuts from the bolts. This is done preceding the removal of the replacement of a steel transition coupling. Transition couplings are often used due to differences in pipe alignment over time. This coupling creates a seal despite those differences and allows for maneuverability when removing or inserting inline devices and unions on a pipeline. At this point, it was determined that the threads and bolts were not able to be separated and needed to be cut. This would be the timeliest solution and allow us easy removal of the transition coupling to move forward with the job. At this point, a small submersible pump was inserted into the sump for dewatering, so that water that drains during the dewatering process can be pumped out of the vault. Using tools to pry away the o-ring of the barrel from the coupling, we were able to start the dewatering process by relieving the pressure beneath the spring line of the pipe. This is done to discharge any potential energy from pressure or residual water due to elevation gaps between the opening created in the pipe and a valve that could be some distance upstream or downstream, but higher in elevation. In those instances, there may be a significant volume of water that needs to be discharged in order to resume the job. This time frame varies from instance to instance. Next, we can see Tom has lowered the crane so that Reno can attach a lifting strap to the two lifting ears installed on the flow tube. This is being done so that upon removal of the existing hardware, the flow tube does not drop or damage anything or anyone in the process. This is done by putting a small amount of tension on the lifting strap from the crane so that when the hardware is removed, there is minimal slip of the flow tube from its position in respect to the pipeline. At this point, Reno below and Tom above on the crane coordinate between each other to achieve this objective. This is followed by loosening of some hardware in a step-by-step -step manner before reaching the end goal. Nearing the end of this endeavor, we can see that both the flow tube and the section of pipe joined with the coupler have come loose, allowing us to move to the next step. We have completed the removal phase of the job, and we see Tom preparing the new flow tube to be lowered into the vault for installation. With the new coupler and flow tube lined up, we see the crew start the process of tightening the new hardware on both the coupler as well as the flow tube, paying special attention to make sure that we make a good seal on both devices. The new piece of flexible metal conduit is now being installed and must be cut to the specific length needed to reach both unions. The wires that were cleaned earlier are now fed through the new conduit and connectors to their termination points inside the terminal housing before everything is tightened down. The wires inside both sets of conductors for this device are stripped of their outer jacket and the individual wires within are stripped back to expose the conductors that are then landed to the terminals within. One last step from a transmitter perspective is that the relationship between each transmitter and flow tube needs to be established. This is done through the calibration process, which is performed on every rose mount magnetic sensor. The calibration process determines a 16-digit calibration number that is unique to every sensor. This calibration number then describes the relationship between the velocity and the induced voltage. Programming this number into the transmitter exactly as stated is essential in receiving accurate flow measurements. This information is not only stamped on the tube itself, but also located in the commissioning documentation. As with most jobs, an excess of materials, debris, wire trimmings, and other such items are removed from the site of the work, leaving as clean of a space as possible for the next person or people who might have to work there. After everything is finalized and cleaned up, our group exits the vault and notifies operations that the site is ready to be pressure tested and have operation restored at the site. At that point, if any leaks are discovered or the reading from our flow tube isn't as expected, minor adjustments may be needed, but our team strives for quality and minimizes the need to revisit work. 
We hope this presentation was insightful and an interesting look into a specific example of the daily work that gets performed behind the scenes throughout our water treatment system. That's all we have for you today with our video presentation. Thanks for joining us.